the address uh, to my key in at least the case that may be same square. I was curious to question. Uh, but well, the one I was curious that how no come that this has worked out. And then I asked the and asked people, you know, what's known about this. And uh, seems like there's a little bit of a disconnection in the community that that actually some things are known, but other people don't know about it. Okay, so, maybe you want to use this? No. Okay, so uh, some of you have seen some of these results that are coming uh, uh, elsewhere, but uh, bear with me, uh, there will be hopefully some new ones too. Okay, um, let's consider some very simple stuff first. How, how this is working. So for instance, if we have two symbols and our sequence, uh, the function is, is just 2n, it's really simple in here to see that, that this uh, space is empty. Uh, just by assign a couple of symbols and see that, that you get stuck. Okay? Uh, in fact, uh, if you have the same type of function, getting any positive integer, then two, any number of symbols, you still get stuck because um, these blocks uh, that this one of those regular intervals like this uh, force you to use another symbol which increases the number of blocks at certain sites and this cube like very quickly and we put it in uh, data so you exhaust any any kind of uh, on the other hand if you just modify this a little bit like this uh, then uh, you have a Quite a lot of uh, two, two sequences that, that go through uh, like this. Uh, so you have a little sequence like that. Okay, so it's almost like this. Uh, are even numbers, there are numbers, but that's not the point. The point is that uh, eventually any number divides this, but doesn't divide that. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, Okay, so let's look at something uh, a bit more interesting. Uh, if we are still having two symbols and the function is now n to the r, and uh, r is, is any uh, integer bigger than 2, then again, parity uh, kills you almost immediately. It just shows that mm -hmm. this space is n to. Uh, okay, now. On the other hand, uh, you can also come up with a function where, uh, where it doesn't go quite like that. So, for instance, these two cases in here, uh, let's just simply use the fact that uh, 3 never divides this number uh, to show that there's a, there's a few different sequences in there, and, and this one has the same property. Uh, you can also remove this class from there when it doesn't matter. Okay, the point being that that no square cannot be used to divide prime. So. Okay, what else would one want to think about? Well, for instance, if you, if you take a still faster growing function and uh, in factorial, you can quickly see that, that uh, for 2 and 3 alphabet uh, things don't work out. Uh, uh, sequences are very quickly cut, terminated. But then, when you go to four symbols, it gets a little bit more interesting. Uh, here's, a, here's a sample of uh, actually uh, five little pieces from a sequence which is half a million long. Uh, and what's rendered in here is <coughs> the rendering is such that. In the bottom row, this here is, is uh, 1, okay? And that black dot means that there's a 1 assigned to that coordinate, okay? Then we lexicographically generate uh, the sequence. This 1 throws, when we put this 1 down in here, we generate the uh, blocks from that exclusions to the future and, and paint them red on that bottom line in every one of these uh, strips. And then we go to the next coordinate and put the next lowest uh, symbol that we can use. So 
that still likes to go generation. Nothing quite well about that, just one way of generating sequences. And here you can see that uh, uh, there's a, uh, or if you look at this carefully, uh, uh, there's a period uh, of like 25 which starts with the until uh, we hit this number, and that's a consequence of the fact that uh, if you generate it like that, then at uh, seven factorial, the result that the period sequence would give you one, which is in contradiction with what one that is an origin, so can't be. But as you can see, the, the, the problem somehow, this like a graphic thing, uh, wiggles through there. <coughs> There's a, there's a transit period in here, and then the period thing continues again. And now, because this 25 uh, devoids any factorial bigger than 10, there's like, uh, we know that there will be these coming uh, forever, these contradictions. So, so then it's a bit unclear if, uh, how does this termination come about. If uh, and uh, you probably can't solve this with a computer. Uh, but so, so it's already slightly, slightly not trivial case. Uh, you also might notice that, that the way the algorithm uh, uh, figures out these, these points where the, or these coordinates where the periodicity would, uh, uh, has to be um, violated, uh, they are a bit different. So this transit is different, different <coughs> than this. Which is yet different from this one. So, so there are uh, some different things going on in there. Okay, um, now to connect this to, to uh, something else, you can also view this as, as languages. And now, uh, uh, it's pretty easy to, to prove this little theorem, uh, which says that if R of Fn is such uh, that for any natural number m, uh, there is an n such that we have this divisibility equation, then uh, the word satisfying this exclusion can't possibly be from uh, the languages. Uh, Obviously, uh, languages are generated by finite total stack. But I don't want to go deeper into that direction. Uh, the reason for this is actually much more understandable for mathematic mathematician because once you know that a context free language has to satisfy a pumping lemma, and, and regular language, which is a simple thing, and context free language also has to satisfy a slightly less demanding uh, pumping lemma. Uh, and pumping lemma, uh, what does pumping lemma mean? It means that any sufficiently long word has to have inside its block, which you can start repeating, uh, take contrary high intervals, and these new words will be in the language again. But now, if you have this divisibility condition valid, which is assumed in here, then you can't do this repetition. That's why, why uh, they, they can't be simple objects like, well, I mean, they, they must be more complicated than, than these two respective ones. Okay. Um, now, let's go back to the powers, but take D uh, at least three. Uh, by, by this previous theorem, they are always um these three things. And uh, you can you can work out something in here uh, uh, quite quite quickly. Uh, for instance these two uh, are empty. By the way, if this is empty the plus that's empty, I think it's it's uh, should be about second. Uh, this can actually still handle by a computer. It's a nice little programming exercise. Uh, we don't need, that need anything very fancy to, to run it. Um, and the sequences are not, never going to be very long. Um, okay, this gets already tough for the computer. 
But then it will be the following that you start randomly generating these sequences. Uh, you get increasing in one with convinced that, that things are pretty small. This must be pretty small sets. Uh, perhaps even active. And um, and that's what, what, what we are gonna do the next. How this goes. They are indeed empty, uh, but the reason why they are is, is, is rather interesting. I think. Uh, you can plug in some additive component products in here. Uh, yeah, yeah, basically it's an enumeration thing. I mean, computer just, in that case, it's able to check out them all. And if you do the program carefully enough, then um, I think it can be used as a good. Um, okay. Now, uh, let's, let's look at the following. Well, the, 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 basic, the basic definition is that if we have a subset of integers, positive integers, then the difference set is a minus a, so all those numbers that you get by uh, computing any possible uh, differences between the members for, for the a. And let's denote uh, its intersection with the first n big n integers uh, by this set. Uh, then one question that one might want to start wondering about is that if you could ask that this holds, that our Fn, when n runs over the naturals, uh, never gets into this set, uh, what does this R have to be like? Uh, okay. Uh, this this question is, is uh, for special cases, has been asked already a long time ago. Uh, there's a, a thing called uh, Lovaz's conjecture. Um, it seems not to have been written down anywhere. It's, it's just a written, uh, I mean, it's just a verbal conjecture. Lovaz has other conjectures as well. This is, this is uh, one, one that he uh, which asks this question exactly when when f m is n squared. Uh, and I was so much hoping that first of all would have been here and would have asked some details from him. Uh, anyway, he was involved in, in settling that conjecture and he, he provided one of the two ways of arguing us with them. This is basically basically the, the result that uh, for any positive delta uh, we have some threshold value depending on delta such that when we are beyond that uh, and this holds meaning that this A hat has density delta at least uh, uh, then there must be a natural number n such that in fact was this uh, uh, I mean uh, n such that this square will belong to that difference. Uh, this was actually this sort of illustrates the, the, the nature of uh, how these uh, questions were so sort of talking around and, and, and uh, that it was, it people in different branches of math, but it was the Sarkozy uh, found a number theoretic uh, proof for this same uh, uh, question. And he actually got a political bound, political bound also for this uh, density. What, what's the maximum density that they can have uh, uh, as a function of that PDN? But anyway, both of them uh, were equal to good ways of observing that. The, the bounds were there because these techniques and the uh, circle method and that sort of things uh, were involved. Now, uh, there apparently there was a Hungarian school uh, which thought about these problems, like the Israeli school that is about these problems. 
Uh, and I will test as well both the, the Israeli school uh, results, but let me just state this next result here uh, from 1994. Uh, these four guys, Bob, Benigan, Pitts, and Zemarelli, they go to four in there. So the, the key here is that we go to the other monomials here. K is, is uh, anything we can add to the Okay? And then there's this, this, this strange feature here. I mean, if you look at this bottom and here, I mean, it's, it's, it's not exactly exploding, but it's an increasing function, right? Um, C is a positive constant, and, and this, this means that uh, uh, you can eventually put a constant in there so that it's an inequality in direction. Uh, so this gives a rate, although it's completely you know, really strange rate, but, but nevertheless it goes to zero. Uh, now, by the way, um, um, yeah, the, the rate that uh, Sarkozy gave in this case was better than that, uh, but apparently the problem gets, gets uh, rather messy. This has been since proved off. And as an illustration of how much this interest, this number there is in that this C was originally 112, and it's been worked to this value, which is average. Uh, at least with that line of argument, the best. Uh, there are even more results, uh, recent results from 2006, there is an improvement for this, this rate. Okay, now, what do these have to do with the, with the problem at hand? Well, uh, there is a connection because uh, what you do now is that you take n to the k, and then you define these sets ai, uh, this is a set of indices j such that xj equals t1. And, and consider now one set, one set of sequences. I think there's an extra set of parentheses that confuse you. So this is just a set of those uh, coordinates where you have the uh, symbol i. Okay, now if your, if your sequence, once I did, if the sequence is well defined everywhere, then these sets a i, when i runs from 1 to v, they are simply naturals. Okay? Uh, so then, uh, this last theorem in particular implies that uh, if the exclusions are called for all of these uh, v uh, subsequences for this given f, then for sufficiently large n the densities of them just can't add up to one anymore. Which is contradictions is assumed that there was a sequence all the way to infinity. So, so that means that then this space has to be empty. And uh, that implies that these are empty for So that's kind of disappointing. But it also tells you that uh, you have to be pretty careful when you try to go outside uh, such as the finite type or shopping systems where you have a finite rule for what's included and what's not. Uh, now, this can be further extended. I, I, I'm not showing you the most general results in this respect. Uh, this result by Bonald and, and, and company has been uh, extended uh, uh, first, to uh, so of intersected polynomials, and for them, the condition is this, which is actually exactly the same condition with different uh, uh, notation than what we had in the language there a couple of slides ago. Okay? Uh, and, and then, even, even that can be generalized further, and as I said, there's another line, the urban theorem arguments, uh, which formulate very powerful results, which I, I'm not gonna quote in here, just they feel like you know hitting with some excessive tool, a little nail. Uh, but, but basically this Zemmerelli line 
of, of uh, uh, results uh, has been extended to polynomials and it could be used here also with the same things. You know, you don't actually need the rate result for this. You just need that, that the density is both zero. Okay. So the moral is, is uh, in some ways that uh, the sequences are sort of trying to wiggle in a complicated way to infinity and they fail, or if they have chance, then they appear in it and then they can go through. Um, now, I didn't just mention this in here uh, because I don't actually know. Maybe there might be somebody in the audience who knows already the answer to this, uh, but I'm glad to hear about that. Uh, this extends, this extends next to something called proper uh, sequences, and and if you can you can show that that's a proper sequence, then uh, then you should be able to do something about that too. Okay. So in a way that the 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 infinite story is is dead at this moment. But there's still interest to look at this question. One of them is that these bounds here are quite obscene. I, I think most people agree that they are not real. Uh, they, they are better, they are artifacts of the Proof, not, not the real thing. Uh, so how does this termination go, go about? And the rest of the time I, I want to talk about that because there's some nice uh, and surprisingly simple probabilistic argument that we use inside that. Okay, this is the simply the algorithm how you go about uh, generating the one-dimensional sequences. So you first put the symbol at the first coordinate, and then you generate for some you have to decide how long your horizon is, how far it is, to be uh, You generate the exclusions all the way to infinity. I mean, all the way to n from that. Simple, but you just chose. Then you go to the next coordinate, number two, and randomly inform the symbol in there, generate the exclusions from that. One bytes only, you don't need to worry about backwards because they are already there if there is any. And, and so on. Then you go on as long as you can, and once all the symbols at some point are already used up, meaning that there's an exclusion for every one of them there, then your symbol terminates. Uh, your sequence terminates. Okay. So, uh, pictorially, it's like this. Your generation uh, goes like this. At the J uh, coordinate, uh, you look at backwards, uh, I call by dragnet this set of points here in the past that send the restriction at this uh, j point. <coughs> and uh, taking that into account, then you put uh, a symbol in here, and then you generate the restrictions uh, to the future of the end. And you have to somehow decide ahead of time. Um, OK. And um, notice that early on, uh, there can't be a termination because there's not enough stuff in this dragnet. But once there are uh, D sites in the dragnet, then you could generate a full block, meaning that if in this dragnet there is every symbol from the alphabet representative, then every symbol is banned in here and you are dead. You can't go there. Okay? And then when you go further on, then even more. Uh, entries are the dragnet, and you have a better chance of terminating because, because it's more likely than, uh, that uh, that the all the symbols are ready. So let's formulate this uh, 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 with a couple of results. Uh, I've got to talk about this interval. So interval means the first interval starts where there's first apparent chance for you to see a full block. For instance, for n squared, uh, f equals to n squared that happens at e squared plus one. And then, first interval, uh, their, their dragon is of size d, and after that, the size turns into d plus one, and so on, it keeps on increasing. Okay, so, so you can show this with uh, little combinatorial uh, uh, 
proving me wrong, that, that you terminate at point of J on the right interval with that value for J. And that's more normal coefficient, and this is just a, I mean, this is a D minus 1 for some nation because there's this collision that applies to here. So I is, is uh, one more bigger. And D is fixed, that's the size of the alphabet, and uh, So um, that's the termination probability on the i interval. So for all j's on the i interval, you have the same probability given that this independence assumption is valid. So now the assumption in here that we make, and this is really uh, you know, a clinical assumption, we assume that actually the stuff in here is independent of this That's the probabilistic simplification of this model. Okay, and now once that is done, then uh, uh, you can see that this uh, this termination probability pi gives you that on the right interval, the termination probability is geometrically is geometrically that that parameter. Um, I say something about the asymptotics of this thing. Uh, you want to handle on this, this pi. It always to go much from one from low because there are probabilities. But now if you if you work on this a little bit, basically analyzing a sort of a d-dimensional generalization of the Pascal's triangle, which is is in the literature called Pascal's simplex. Uh, certain properties in there. Because, I mean, that's what that's what involves this summation. Okay? But there are these uh, exclusions in here. So, so this uh, this k has to be bigger than one for you to have a blocking symbol, and it obviously has to be less than the the, the total sum that is restricted. This. Okay, uh, but once you worked out how that, how that uh, thing works, uh, the simplex, you have to take a certain subset from there and its size, and uh, measure its size well enough, then you can get this geometric problem, which is, which is the point in here, that this difference is bound by this geometric grade in here. And this is just a constant because you have fixed the size of that. Uh, in the okay. And once you have this, then uh, you can you can prove that uh, that uh, well this looks a bit bad, but it's just what comes out of this. Uh, it's a compound geometric process. Here. Uh, um, um, for every one of the uh, intervals, the whole distribution time is geometric. And then you can show that the, the lengths of the intervals are not constant. They vary depending on this f. One starts here is the, the, the cleanest, at least the existence square. But you can set up this theorem also for more general. Then you just get more complicated stuff in here and in here. But as long as you can handle for f, uh, to show that uh, uh, sort of uniformize their length or, or give, a, give a suitable upper bounds for how quickly they grow their lengths. Uh, and then uh, finally, at the, at the last page, you put Antelli, then you can get this thing that the sequence is generated with this holistic model, they are the most surely finite. Okay, uh, now is this model any good? Uh, just a quick reality check. No, uh, uh, well, well, we might get a couple of comments about that first. Uh, you might worry about these sums that are these really <coughs> profitable. And indeed, there are some difficulties when I and D are large uh, because there's a lot of, there has to be something there. and. Uh, 
uh, we have resorted to just observations that we have been short of uh, but, uh, but for for low, low, for low value use of I, uh, you can actually use the complementary identities, you can this type of process. You can, you can see the divider at some age, but I mean, it's, uh, if, if D is large and you know, this is D much larger at some age, you can be able to focus D, but it isn't. Um, that's both, and D and I are it. Then you have to approximations. Uh, the other thing is that, that uh, the distribution is sort of jacked, but not as rhetorically. Uh, if you look at the probability that was described a couple of uh, slides ago, uh, the whole the probability is behave uh, better and better as rhetorically. I mean, the ratio behaves better and better. So, uh, in, in that sense, uh, early on there are big jumps, as we will see. Okay, now I presented this for x squared, but, but there's no reason why you wouldn't apply it for that or, or, uh, or some, other, some other function, as long as you can do this communication. Okay, now how good is this? Uh, this is uh, just not to stay honest and see whether this would be any good model. So, what's in here is the number of first, this is up at the point, then, and, uh, and uh, uh, 15. And the red line is what the model gives, and the, and the uh, blue dots are what you get from the data, and the data is like tens of millions of dollars. Uh, the numbers are there in the table data lines. Uh, so you see that there's, there's a pretty good difference here. In here, uh, you know, there are these offsets in here, but the overall should be somehow a bit. And there you start seeing sort of symmetrization of the thing and, uh, and some sort of a shape forming in there with the jackets that I already want. This is nothing but log of that data up there in log of this blue dot stuff. And the fact that this looks like it's piecewise constant when there's enough data, meaning that you stay away from this tail, uh, they look like piecewise linear pieces. And, and that just tells you that it's geometric mechanism that, that uh, dominates the sequences. Um, OK. So uh, now, this is a bit upsetting in here, this thing, uh, these offsets. And uh, you, can, you can sort of see where they come from. They come from the independence assumption, but it's hard to refine the model in such a way, at least in the case of n squared, that uh, they would go away. I don't know what to do. And uh, basically, it has to do with the fact that you can, you can show these that inequalities like this all, or this setup. What's happening in here is that uh, we have uh, downstairs we have a coordinate and upstairs we have symbols. So these two symbols are k squared away and these two symbols are n squared away. And then these two are n squared and these two are again k squared from each other. And now if you think about how you are, what you get at x on your side x. And you compare how it happens in that model and how it happens for the real sequences. Then it turns out that it's critical uh, whether k squared plus n squared is itself a square or not. And, and when you think about uh, how it goes, you can establish these two uh, probabilities. But it's also clear that now, if you think about that in here, you look at everything that is coming from the dragnet, meaning from pairs like this uh, in the past, meaning that if you change the k and n in the allowed range, meaning that you don't go beyond one in here, there are way many more pairs uh, of k and n, so that uh, the sum of the squares is itself. 
not a square. Right? It is a square. Um, also, and, and these actually then uh, seem to explain why you have this offset in the, in the the probabilities in the previous slide for the distributions. Uh, now, this is just the problem with the uh, exponent 2, because we all know that these sort of things don't happen for higher exponent. So that would perhaps mean that, that, that this works even better for the, for the higher one than else, but I don't have anything to say about that. No. Uh, okay. So, okay, this is some data. I don't feel like numerical stuff, but I have to do this. Uh, uh, this is what you see in the sequences when you generate that sort of numbers in the last column. And this is what the, what the model gives you for the mean and for the standard deviation. So, like, so like if you look at the five symbols, A's, these are actually pretty close to each other. So, it's not too bad. Uh, and this refers to the fact that I mentioned earlier that it's a bit difficult to compute this D and I. Uh, I mean, the problem is when D and I are not large. Okay, but based on this, and um, uh, I, would, I, I want to flip the slide because I would like to get feedback from somebody who perhaps, uh, um, perhaps study something similar. It looks to me like there could be a central limit theorem here for determination uh, when d increases. Uh, when you do the suitable, uh, suitable scaling, and this exponent, I'm quite sure that this is, this is correct. This is the scaling that you have to do. This, uh, uh, I wouldn't bet my, my uh, um, well, I mean, very much, I mean, this, um, these are fractions, always, okay? Uh, but but uh, the reason why I want to present this is that I, I think there's pretty good evidence that there's a simple limit there, and in scaling exponents sort of distinguish different types of phenomena in different classes, and with, with like this pair, I'm sure in some other context it might be interesting to look, you know, whether there's actually some sort of mapping from one problem to another, and perhaps get some progress from there. Uh, also, this of course should go for the for the model. I haven't quite proved it, but but I think that's true. But to do that for the for the for the actual one-sided sequences would be a nice result. So sort of complementing this this uh, uh, emptiness result, uh, the central limit theorem of course doesn't apply to emptiness. It almost it would imply that almost true emptiness. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but it would give another kind of much more accurate description of the uh, of determination. Let me just show you this. This is for, for alphabet size 5, this is for PhD. Uh, what's plotted in here? Uh, this is where you see for the first time that there is n coming. That you, when you generate a symbol down, you generate somewhere in the future a situation where all symbols are used up. So you, then you know that that you're going to terminate. And this measures the distance, how far that site is going to be, uh, how far that site is from where you are now. So this is actually a log of the distribution. So the distribution is very heavily uh, uh, concentrated in here. And this is just the support of the distribution. And you notice that in, in the case of this very small alphabet of five symbols, there's still some interesting combinatorial stuff going on there of this abrupt termination and then these lines which mean that, that there is no sequence that terminates at this at, at the way that this blank, uh, what these blanks represent in here at certain distance with a certain diagram. There must be some combinatorial reason for that. Well, on the other hand, when you have more symbols, this turns out into what looks like completely random problem. There's no such combinatorial uh, conservation laws or public power uh, seemingly at play anymore. Uh, so for piety, it looks like a random problem. 
And uh, maybe, I mean, this resembles a little bit this case in the analysis of algorithms. Uh, the, the average case behavior of algorithm and the worst case behavior. Because these bounds are just, just uh, very, 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 very big compared to what this probabilistic model is represents what the average case behavior, average case behavior is for this, this, this uh, uh, generation algorithm. All right. 